We are hurtling toward the day when climate change could be irreversible. Rising sea levels already altering this nation's coast. China's capital is choking in its worst pollution of the year. Five percent of species will become extinct. Sea levels rising, glaciers melting. If we do nothing, the picture of the world is one of absolute devastation. There's no convincing scientific evidence for man-made climate change. We're spewing 162 million tons of human-caused global warming pollution into it every single day, as if this is an open sewer. Satellite data demonstrate in the last 17 years there's been zero warming, none whatsoever. It's why, you remember how it used to be called global warming? And then magically the theory changed to climate change? Sure. The reason is it wasn't warming, but the computer models still say it is, except the satellites show it's not. We are in the beginning of a mass extinction, and all you can talk about is the money and fairy tales of eternal economic growth. How dare you? Drill, baby, drill. You can have the best capitalism, global capitalism in the world, but if people are dead, they're dead. It's over. Enough is enough. The world is at a breaking point. Catastrophic climate change, biosphere collapse, and a global energy crisis have been met with apathy, denial, and despair. He's going to take everything we know and love. Like clockwork, our corporate overlords present us with two untenable options. Submit to an Orwellian itinerary of energy rationing and population control, or ride the status quo into the abyss. Both sides are right, and both sides are wrong. Which means both sides are missing a critical piece of the puzzle. Since the early 2000s, uh, we have seen an increasing number of unauthorized and or unidentified aircraft or objects in military controlled training areas uh, and training ranges and other designated airspace. Some of them appeared to remain stationary in winds aloft, move against the wind, maneuver abruptly or move at considerable speed without discernible means of propulsion. Um, that's pretty intriguing. I think I would, uh, without discernible means of propulsion, I would say that uh, we're not aware of any adversary that can move an object without discernible means of propulsion. The phrase unidentified flying object is a deliberately obfuscating term. What it really is, is an alternative energy and propulsion device. This is the real reason for the secrecy. These technologies, if they were disclosed, would end fossil fuels, pollution, and poverty overnight and usher in a new era of abundance, freedom, and peace. Instead, they have been kept secret for over a hundred years. Dr. Stephen Greer, the world's leading expert on UFOs and extraterrestrial intelligence, has been advising presidents and heads of state for 30 years on the urgency of the situation. We don't have much time left. What is this lost century? This lost century is literally a hundred years, more than that now, of technologies that have existed that have vanished. I mean, I was just recently in a meeting in Washington with the people who manage the black budget of the United States. They have no access to this material because between the late 1800s and now, the ingenious inventions and sciences that could have moved us off that extinction level path that we're on have all been ruthlessly suppressed, confiscated. And the only way that's going to change it is not going to change in Washington. It is not going to change in a large corporation. Unlikely. It's going to change by us, the people doing it. So it's about us. Let's look at this. You know what this is? Dude, this is a fucking drone, bro. There's a whole fleet of them. Look on the ASA. Oh my gosh. They're all going against the wind. The wind's 120 knots from the west. Oh, I think, dude. 
This is an alternative energy and propulsion device. These are things that have existed all the way back into the 60s. But the one that they call the Tic Tac here off the coast of San Diego, the white one, looked very much like this. These have been made by the Lockheed Skunk Works. And my favorite letter of all time, the head of the Lockheed Skunk Works, Ben Rich, look at the date on it, 1986. It was an answer to a letter someone wrote and says, are these UFOs man-made or extraterrestrial? He says, many of our man-made UFOs are really unfunded opportunities, meaning if it was released for public use, it'd be an enormous industry. Every meeting I go in Washington, I say, see that thing you guys are all talking about? That's Lockheed Skunk Works. They have left us behind, and everything we see out in our world today is absolutely a construct. It's an absolute construct. The internal combustion engines are obsolete. The nuclear power plants are obsolete. The coal fire plants are obsolete. We have the wind generators. Those are obsolete. The solar power, it's all obsolete. If we could follow the gravity research that the contractors and research institutions have been doing, we could see that bright future as well. So a lot of people say, well, how is this thing moving? <laughs> There's no fuel on board. There's no nuclear power plant. There's no jets and no rockets. Well, way back in the 40s, Dr. Casimir, he predicted, and later it was proven in the 50s, what's called the zero-point energy field. Zero-point energy, or what Nikola Tesla called radiant energy, is the most profound and transformative gift that the quantum world offers us. The seemingly empty vacuum of space is actually a roiling sea of virtual particles fluctuating in and out of existence, and all those fluctuations require energy. If we could tap into this energy source, we would unlock a virtually unlimited reservoir of clean, free energy. Extraterrestrial spacecraft are known to harness zero-point energy. US is under, or US scientists is understanding oh, what this was. It was an energy device that used zero-point energy. That's what they referred it to as zero-point energy. And it was connected in such a manner that this device could power, I mean, from a very small flashlight or a very small watch up to a city. And power was determined by what the demand on it was. The implications of free energy go far beyond bringing monthly electric bills to zero or running a car without gasoline. Most of the cost of making anything, from growing food to building a skyscraper, is the energy of pulling raw materials out of the ground, shipping, processing, shipping again, and so on. If the cost of energy goes to zero, the cost of agriculture and manufacturing becomes negligible. Other critical solutions, like water desalinization to end drought or air purification, both of which are prohibitively expensive due to energy costs, would suddenly become viable in a free energy paradigm. A new world where humans live in perfect harmony with nature is possible within our lifetimes. But this would mean the end of oil, gas, and coal, as well as the centralized power grid and the global macroeconomic system, which will stop at nothing to protect the hundreds of trillions of dollars at stake. <laughs> the consequences of keeping all this secret. We are in the process right now of, of doing something that I've termed planet aside. The deliberate killing of an entire planet with malice of forethought through greed and stupidity and power. All the damage we're going to see in a few minutes, totally avoidable. Every bit of it since the 1920s, at least. And we can prove this. I'm afraid that the term planetocide is all too real. The ecocide doesn't really say it. We are in the process of destroying the biosphere, destroying a habitable world for certainly the majority of the animals on the planet. I'm an older guy. I won't be around to see the worst of this, but I have not just trepidation, but terror at what's going to be faced by my son's generation and the generations that come after him. 
When, when someone asks me how bad is the crisis, I kind of don't know where to begin. Because what does that even mean? Does it mean what is the threat to humanity? Have we reached some kind of tipping point? There are certain things that get under my skin or that especially alarm me. And one of them is the insect holocaust, for lack of a better word. The precipitous decline in the number of insects, the number of species, the total biomass of insects. You know, a lot of studies put that decline at 80%. When I was a child, when we went on a long drive, especially in the summer, like we'd have to have the windshield wipers on from time to time to clear off the bug splatter. Like you just don't have that anymore. Insects are like the foundation of the terrestrial food chain. Like you can't have a thriving ecosystem without thriving insects. That this is the sixth great extinction that's happening on the planet and it's 100% man-made, all of it. We have to all awaken because of what's happened, I think we're like a frog being boiled slowly and suddenly we're gonna wake up and find out, you know, it's too late. 150 species every day go extinct. Now these aren't all animals, they're all kinds of species. The planet has been dying uh, at human hands for a long time. A naturalist I like, J.B. McKinnon, he calls the world a 10% world as kind of a poetic expression of how much life has declined. So there's maybe 10% of the whales that there were 500 years ago, and the, the seabirds, and the wetlands, and the mangrove swamps, you know, and the fish biomass. We don't even know what we have lost, although in some level we feel it. This is, this is part of the despair, part of the alienation and, and the anguish that sensitive people feel. You know, ice caps are melting, uh, the oceans are certainly going to rise. It could rise as much as 20 feet if, if we have the big ones melt. This is all the way back in, in 1958, and there was a full page color ad in Life magazine. Everybody was reading Life magazine at the time. And it's by an oil company, which was the predecessor of Exxon, which was called Humble. Each day, Humble supplies enough energy to melt 7 million tons of glacier. Here they're, they're bragging about it in 1958. So this company gets rebranded as Exxon in the 1970s. And in July 1977, they have a meeting inside Exxon headquarters where their chief scientist, James Black, is showing slides that are warning that burning fossil fuels are going to eventually endanger all of humanity. They know this in 1977. Present thinking holds that man has a time window of 15 years before the need for hard decisions regarding changes in energy strategies might become critical. Well, those 15 years were up in the early 1990s. Look at this. How long ago was it recognized that this was a disaster? Senior scientist Exxon, 45 years ago. And actually it was known before then. This is insanity. This is a civilization gone mad. These companies have really not been held accountable. We've lived in a fossil fuel economy now for more than 100 years, and it's just been accelerating. The amount of wealth has been increasing. You have situations now where the head of ExxonMobil goes on to become the Secretary of State, Rex Tillerson under President Trump. And I'm an environmentalist. You, a lot of people don't understand that. I think I know more about the environment than most people. So there is really very little uh, accountability that exists. Many scientists, such as myself, have discovered that there are very concerted, well-oiled machines that provide false information, even to scientific and academic programs, it's called capture, where they try to rationalize away this problem and everything's fine. One company, Exxon alone, has funded more than 40 different groups to keep alive its campaign to deny the worst impacts of climate change. There was a guy named Martin Hoffert, and he's a professor of physics at New York University, a consultant to Exxon for their climate modeling during the 1980s. And he said this, the advertisements that Exxon ran in major newspapers raising doubt about climate change were contradicted by the scientific work we had done and continued to do. Exxon was publicly promoting views that its own scientists knew were wrong, and we knew that because we were the major group working on this. This was immoral and has greatly set back efforts to address climate change. 
here's a case where the Canadian government ordered the scientists not to disclose the extent of it. So what you get in the media is, is a very sanitized version of this problem, which many people believe we may have already gone over the edge of the red line, how far we can go without a safe return to a sustainable civilization. China is the world's biggest greenhouse gas emitter by a huge margin. And if there's anything clear so far coming out of this year's Communist Party Congress, it's that coal is having a bit of a revival in the world's second largest economy. A senior energy official said China will give full play to coal as ballast in the country's energy mix. Why are we digging stuff up out of the ground when we haven't needed to burn coal? since about the 1920, 1930 time period. Here's your solar panels. I had to replace my solar panels with high more, and they all end up in a landfill and they're toxic. You know, we're working in a paradigm, whether it be fossil fuels or what is being proposed as new energy, that isn't gonna work. I'm certainly not opposed to renewable technologies, but you know, they are dependent on weather. <laughs> They're dependent on how much wind there is in an area, or they're able to harness of the, of the sun. And they cost an awful lot to bring up to speed. No environmentalist wants to see vast landscapes converted to biofuels, or pit mines to mine silver and cobalt and lithium, wind turbines that kill birds and, and mar the landscape. This isn't what we signed up for, but this is what happens when we abdicate our relational care for every place and ecosystem and being on Earth and transfer that onto yet another quantitative cost-benefit paradigm. And you have lithium fields. The amount of pollution from these lithium mining operations for lithium-ion batteries in your Tesla, not to mention they catch fire periodically. Now, fair enough, I'm an emergency and trauma doctor, Gasoline cars catch fire more. <laughs> I, I can tell you some horror stories, which I'm sure you don't want to hear. And then we have this whole morass of how we're living, you know, on wires that we haven't needed. And so the entire system is set up to benefit a relatively small number of global oligarchs and financial interests that we absolutely have to say enough. They've had 150 years to do this. If we want to live among other life in the future and not in a concrete hellscape where we retreat into virtual worlds to compensate for the loss of what is alive, then we have to change our ways. And we have to start acting from our care for life. Most of you know that there are these nanoparticulate plastics that are in the entire food chain. They cause cancer, they disrupt hormones, they damage your brain. And why? Well, if we had quote unquote free energy systems from what we're going to describe this zero point energy field, you would never have to have anything wasted because you'd have 100% recycling because the cost of the energy would be zero. And then we have all these famines happening around the world because of the absolute social injustice of a system that is driven by greed and scarce resources. When, as Tesla pointed out, there's an infinite amount of energy to be tapped in what has now been quantified as the zero point energy field. How do you tap it? Now, mainstream science says it can't be tapped. It's there theoretically. Not true. And you're going to find out how untrue that is. International Panel on Climate Change, which issues annual reports about the dire state of things that we're facing, it says in their latest report that over the next decade alone, between 32 million and 130 some million people are going to be driven into poverty because of the changing climate in their countries. Three billion people, almost half the world's population, has no way to cook their food. They have no way to heat. But what they're doing they have to to survive is cutting down the rainforest and cutting down the scrub and shrubs in the desert. You have what's called the desertification, where you have the growth of deserts going on exponentially. You can take maps from 40 years ago and now and just see the growth of this dead zone. Why? You have 3 billion people that don't even have, even if they had access to fossil fuels, they don't have access. This is how they're living. It's not only that 3 billion people don't have access to 
energy sources. It's also that their way of life is under constant assault by our own, primarily through the um, financial system that imposes debt through development loans and other mechanisms on most of the world, who then must, in order to meet the debt payments, must convert their environment into commodities and their time and energy into labor for the global marketplace. So if you don't include those kinds of issues, and you're only talking about, let's bring more energy to the world so they can, so that we can raise them up to be like ourselves. <laughs> Come on, it's not working. Being like ourselves is not working. Look at the depression, look at the suicide, look at the addiction, look at the obesity, look at the despair. This is not a fit destination <laughs> to evangelize throughout the world. We need some humility here. The dire emergency in East Africa, the drought there exacerbating the hunger crisis. As many as 20 million people could be starving by the middle of this year, half of them children. I firmly believe there can be no peace on this planet without justice. And there can be no justice when half the population of the world is required to live in abject poverty. It's a direct result of the world's energy system. So I always liken this, we're living in this sort of the Truman Show. It's a perfect metaphor for the world we're living in now where, you know, the people who are saying we need more oil, gas, and coal until we get something to replace it, they're right. <laughs> Look what's happening all over the world. On the other hand, the people who say we can't just keep in drill, baby, drill, and burning oil and gas and coal because we're destroying the biosphere. And they're right. Now, when both sides are right and both sides are wrong, Someone's been had, we've been had, by people who want to deceive us and think that we're, we're actually having a, a, a legitimate debate about energy and the environment. We are not. We're all Jim Carrey living in this Truman Show of a construct. So everyone's saying, well, you know, we don't have enough fossil fuels coming out, and the density of energy from solar and wind isn't enough, so let's build more of these. Well, then you're stuck with one million years of toxic, life-killing waste from nuclear reactors. Greenhouse gas emissions would only decrease, according to a recent study, by 4% if we double the amount of energy that we're getting from nuclear power by 2050. Well, that's not a very good statistic to think about. Most people think when nuclear power plant is running, that you're somehow getting energy from the atom directly. No. What you're doing is splitting the atom, as it were, creating a lot of heat that boils water, heats water, it turns a steam engine, like a choo-choo train in 1849 coming out to the gold rush in California. That's all a nuclear power plant is, except you're stuck with a million years of waste. And this is the other problem. The distribution of the power from the point that you have the primary source by the time you generate it, transmit it through the inefficient transmission lines, and then the, your, your wiring in your device or your home, you've lost at least 66%. So 66% of the energy is completely wasted. So here's your energy grid. 12% is a new renewable. The rest is the old system. So if you plug in your electric car, 88% of the power it's coming from gas and oil and coal. The entire world is running on an energy paradigm of scarcity, meaning that there's never more energy than we generate. And we lose that energy as we move it around and deploy it in different ways. And so energy is expensive. And it, energy is difficult to get to remote areas. And that energy is important because it's inputs in growing food and its inputs in manufacturing, and its inputs in the economy, and its inputs in all of these things that make people's lives better and that solve the problems that desperately need to be solved on the planet right now. Overunity is a very simple idea. It's that you're getting more energy out of something than you're putting into it. And according to mainstream science, that's impossible. What free energy devices suggest is that there is a limitless supply of usable energy that's always coming into reality, and that we're not living in a universe of fundamental scarcity. 
So over Unity is more than just a breakthrough that's going to live its life in a technical paper. That's not that. It's really the ability of humans to liberate themselves. Yes, there is a history, a long history of over Unity systems. For example, Nikola Tesla had one. Basically, his big magnifying transformer that he had in, on Long Island was such an over Unity system. He got the entire Earth itself in resonance. Everything going on is feeding energy into the Earth starts to feed energy into that wave that he created. So he gets a lot more energy in his resonant wave fed from outside, from the environment in the interior of the Earth. His idea was you could then put in a, a tap on it anywhere else on the world and extract it free. And of course, J.P. Morgan's take on that was, that's foolish, you can't put a meter on it. So that uh, actually doomed much of Tesla's career at that point when Morgan found out that he, Tesla, was going to produce the energy freely. But I love this quote. If you want to find the secrets of the universe, think in terms of energy, frequency, and vibration. Now, the reason he said that is that when you use what's called a very high voltage system, you can tap in to what Professor Casimir called the zero point energy field. Some people call it the quantum vacuum. Other people, like Professor Dirac, modestly called it the Dirac C. And we just tested a device last month in the Arizona desert, you'll see in a moment, that is based on that. Nobody is really trying to get, for example, over unity, more energy out of something than you put in, because it's assumed that that is impossible. Well, that might be impossible, but only if you don't really understand the fabric of reality itself. They just can't believe it, especially engineers, because I, uh, I know how we were taught, right? There is no vacuum energy. You're just a coop when you think so, right? Uh, if they took a little more physics, they would go, well, maybe. It's not a small thing. It's not a matter of, of finding proof for some technology, for some invention, and convincing everybody of it. You can't convince somebody of something that so totally contradicts their basic assumptions about the universe. But what if there's a pool of energy available to us that we didn't even think was possible because we're operating on these 100 plus year old assumptions? We can't find this excess energy simply because no one's looking for it. So-called empty space isn't really empty at all. It's actually full of energy. So instead of being like kind of a quiet, empty lake, it's more like the froth at the base of a waterfall or something. But when you go to look at the numbers, you find out that there's enough energy in the volume of a coffee cup to say, evaporate all the world's oceans if you could get it all of it. And here we have a car from 1921 running without a plug. Now look at this old car. And it was pulling energy out of, they just said, out of the environment. They, didn't, they couldn't quantify what, but they had the correct frequency. And this had a battery and some wiring. And it was running, 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 running around without being plugged in. Memo to Tesla Motors, go and research this. Get rid of your plug-ins. And this is one of my favorite, 1902. A farmer and, and engineer named Stubblefield with Tesla, he had something they called the Earth Battery or the stubble-filled battery, and it had rods going into the earth and some wiring, and it was picking up this magnetic flux field of the planet, and he was running his farm, and Tesla was there with him, 1902. So when I say 100 years, lost century, no. I do not wish to talk about it myself, but I've been a victim of quite a bit of suppression. So has any other legitimate researcher in this area. The government is protecting the interests of the oil industry because they're in bed together. Tremendous amounts of contributions for politicians come from these huge companies. And these huge companies have been covering up for years what we're doing to the planet. Today, we don't have so much big kingdoms. We have cartels. We have a whole set of cartels in an area, interlocking corporations. And behind this, we have a few people who are quite wealthy and who own most things. Any time we have a very powerful cartel or set of people that control a lot of things, that resists any means of changing its inflow of control and its inflow of funds and money and its power. You know, everybody's trying to be the big monkey. It's really as simple as that. Here we have 
all the methods. Some of these are common sense, but every one of these are ones I have encountered and investigated personally with geniuses, engineering geniuses, and physics geniuses, but strategically impaired inventors. Black shelving. So someone comes along, they offer you $20 million for your device, it's a corporation, they put it on a shelf. Boom. National security orders. We're going to show you one from a man we just met with. Patent seizures. Financial entanglements from investors because they're doing their whole business and legal strategy wrong. Legal entanglements where they end up in court. Threats to the individuals. I had a guy under contract building one. All you had to do is have some thugs come in and say, you, your wife, you're dead, you stop this. And he stopped. And then scientific fraud. The more powerful the agency, the more powerful the group, the more powerful the cartel, the more they will resort not only to legal means, but to extra legal means to suppress their competition. For example, the greatest espionage in the world is industrial espionage between one corporation and another right here in America. They're the ones that hire all the spies and the spooky equipment and everything like that by far more than the intel agents do. And it's not one cartel, so there are many, many groups in energy, and each of those has become very powerful in its own area, and each one does not wish to see simple little electrical taps pulling out enormous energy from the vacuum. They would much rather see you burning a lot more oil and so forth. So there's something nefarious afoot. Uh, it kind of makes sense from, like, I'm threatening an oil monopoly and things like that. I, okay, so it, I said pretty early on, the problem is suppression wasn't really, how do I make a free energy machine? It's, how do I uh, not get suppressed? Because, what, what, like, what's the point? If you, if you make it, you're just going to get clobbered. And then you have a, a really big one, media corruption. Or why doesn't everyone in the world know these things have existed? Because, as you'll see in a little bit, the media, at a certain high level, have operatives from the intelligence community who kill stories on demand. And then the worst, of course, went works. It's not totally mafia type stuff. It's not like, you know, you just flat get shot. There's some of that. The typical threat is threat to the family, right? It's a, it's a typical mafia, right? It's not just watch the Godfather, see how they work, right? There's a, an interesting record of people that have come up with new alternatives to the oil and gas industry uh, who have met untimely demises. I don't know if you'd say that's true in terms of Nikola Tesla specifically, but he was hit by a taxi cab back in the early 1930s and didn't die immediately, but then died alone in a hospital room a few years later. When they found out that Tesla had passed away in the Hotel New Yorker, they came in, they had the manager of the hotel open the safe, and they took all of Tesla's papers. So here you have an actual FBI document and the Department of Defense is demanding they turn over what they seized in 1943. Now, this used to be an urban myth. Oh, well, he had these secret inventions and papers and the government stole it. No, it's right here. That technology and what was in those boxes, what was written in those papers, we do not know and we may not ever know. So they go in, the FBI takes it, here the Department of Defense years later is saying, we want all those papers that you confiscated in 1943 upon Nikola Tesla's death. And then you have just flat out patent confiscation through the national security orders. Look at this, this is 12 years ago, 5,135 inventions seized under national security orders. In 1971 list includes patents for solar voltaic that were subject to restriction because they were more than 20% efficient. The most efficient solar panel you can get right now in 2022 is 22.8%. These were way past that in, how many years is that? 51 years ago. Okay, we're not talking about a, an extraterrestrial spacecraft or anti-gravity or gravity control. We're talking about just a super efficient solar panel. Those are confiscated. This is one of my favorite statements of this report. One may fairly ask if disclosure of such technologies could really have been detrimental to the national security or whether the opposite would be closer to the truth. Yeah, we hear the words vital interests of national security. 
Well, what we're really talking about there, in terms of Iraq, for example, in the early 2000s, which was all trumped up. There were no weapons of mass destruction. That's what was being touted by the media, Sir Judith Miller at the New York Times and others, to justify what we were doing to get rid of Saddam Hussein. But in fact, the only national security implication of that was the oil industries, what, what they get from it. But again, what does national security mean here? Oil, gas, petrodollar, Goldman Sachs, J.P. Morgan Chase, that's the national security in the abused, corrupt system. It's a, a policy that the military seems to feel is necessary for national security. However, at this point, we often wonder 50 years after World War II and the Cold War, whether uh, such sequestering is necessary, especially when fossil fuels are a major cause of global warming. So here we have a man. He was fired, Dr. Tom Vallone, he's a PhD physicist. He was a patent examiner and he saw these amazing technologies being confiscated. This is not a conspiracy theory. And he blew the whistle, they fired him. You know, because he saw things that would save the planet. Now this is way back in the 80s or 90s. Patent uh, sequestering, which is actually called secretizing, the uh, public needs to know at least that every major military agency has a representative at the patent office. Patent office in its current approach is it's actually breaking the law. It's trying to make happy the uh, physicists who are with American Physical Society to keep them in power with their ideas, you might say, and withhold from public use good inventions that could solve our problems, like the energy crisis. Boeing had just finished some work on some propulsion system. Boeing had done it for the Air Force, and they finished the job. And then they applied to their customer at the Air Force for permission to use it on Boeing's commercial airlines, and they were denied. An example of the ongoing suppression of, of things that are seem to be innocuous and a slight improvement in, in technology. So, you know, T. Henry Moray had a device, no input energy, once he got it set up, output 50 kilowatts. He had multiple assassination attempts and finally was bankrupted in his lap. This was the 1930s. There is absolutely no question that T. Henry Moray had a system that produced about 50 kilowatts out of a 55-pound box. There's uh, all kinds of skullduggery that happened there. The Russians even tried to kidnap him at one time. It reads like a James Bond movie, but it's real. It really happened, and it really happened here in the United States. Here's a friend of mine. He was a Wright-Patterson, Project Blue Book guy. But when he retired, he built a device that you could put on the air intake of a car. This is in the 80s, where you would get anywhere from 20 to 40-some percent more range, miles per gallon, on conventional. I treat air, and out of air, I make it more than just providing oxygen for the combustion process. There are combustion-stimulating molecules and radicals generated in this process. Thunderstorm in a bottle. He had his lab vandalized, everything stolen, bomb threats, etc. This is a colonel who put his entire life savings into something in the 80s that would have been a game changer. But it wasn't a free energy device. It wasn't something just running out of the zero point. It would have just gotten more efficiency and cleaned up the air. Environmental Protection Agency is a bit of a dictatorial police agency. They call themselves a protecting agency, but they are a police agency. EPA cannot approve a fuel-saving device. They put out reams of documentation stating that something will not work. This gentleman actually took a device from a Russian immigrant and another and kind of packaged it. He didn't actually understand it that much. And you had 26, almost 27 watts going in. 7,460 watts going out and tested and verified by multiple labs. Gray started developing this idea eight years ago. For the past year and a half, he's been trying to get someone in the U.S. government interested. So far, he's had little luck. Gray says he's been getting the same reaction he got 30 years ago when he first proposed his theory. Get this guy out of here, he is crazy. But Gray says it's paranoia. The scientific community isn't willing to accept teachings opposite all previous learning. And the military aerospace industry is afraid to admit decades and billions of dollars worth of research have been wasted. Now, unfortunately, 
This disappeared because he actually took the ideas from some geniuses and was trying to make a lot of money. And so his became, I'm calling this crazy inventor syndrome. Uh, it's not very nice, but I mean, it's, it's kind of crazy. And here's why it's crazy. They think I have the, the, the best thing since sliced bread and the world's going to be the path to my door. And they don't realize they're going to have corrupt interests from the national security state, corporations, and all kinds of other people stop them. So they think they're going to do a normal investment and normal venture capital and patent it or keep the secret sauce of how it works away from everyone. And in every single case for 100 plus years, they've taken that knowledge to their grave. Uh, you've seen the paranoid inventor, plenty of stories on those guys. It's my precious. I, go, I can't share my secret. Everybody will take it from me, right? That, this paranoid, I, I have it. This is worth gazillions of dollars and everything else. And they're so naive, they know, have no idea. At first, they think they're the first, right? Have no idea of the history of this and what happens to the others. So having done that for 31 years now, I have been dealing with people with these devices since 1991. Almost all of them fall into some part of this syndrome, and it's a tragedy. You'll see the device, I'll have engineers come in and test it, and they go, oh no, I'm going to keep it secret, nobody can know but me, and I need to make a bunch of money, they want to be the next Rockefeller of energy, and the next thing you know, they're dead, or the device is confiscated, or it vanishes in a buyout. So this guy had the same problem. He had a device, they have it there, still running. And, but they think that no one can know this but them. They're buying into the paranoia. My answer is open source it, dump it on the internet, blockchain, or any way you can. You have no patent, no intellectual property. The whole world knows about it, and every scientific lab in, a, in the world can reproduce it. We're going to get to this strategy in a minute. That's how we go. We've got to do that. Because the very definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over and expecting a different result. That's attributed to Einstein. But how true is that here? So we have to change our strategy. Many of these inventors are really good at the technical stuff, but they're not great communicators. This power is something I have given my life for, for you the people. Now I set up this demonstration for y'all. You don't have to be a rocket scientist. They're not good at business. <laughs> they're not. Like, God can make technical geniuses and he can make business savvy people, but rarely do the two come together in one person. This story is fascinating because he had a, a tiny, you know what 17 watts is? Like, a, you know, a 20 watt light bulb. It was putting out 200 watts, 10 to 15 times, more output than input. And this is in the 80s, this is 40 years ago. I was not convinced probably on the first three times that I saw the device and saw it tested that, uh, that indeed it put out more energy than it, than it took in. I am convinced now. Uh, I was a little bit prejudiced and like all people that come up with uh, devices like this, you think they're wrong and so you go down to prove them wrong if you're that interested. And I was not able to prove him wrong, nor were the people that I was with able to prove him wrong. And here's what happened. He kept the whole thing so secret. He was going through a patenting process, but even the patent application left out a lot of the secret sauce. Most of these inventors do this. Fatal mistake. And what happened is that it was all covered up, that he actually was taken to court. Patent office said, even though he had proof that it worked for multiple very esteemed scientists, patent examiners, that proved that the thing actually did as he said it did, and he got nowhere. He took this to his grave. Look at this video that you're going to see in a moment. Mr. Newman has been fighting for a patent for years. Many, therefore, considered it ironic when a federal judge appointed the former head of the patent office, William Schuyler, to decide if Newman's device did or did not work. Mr. Schuyler, who is also considered to be an expert on electrical engineering, didn't take long to make his decision. In a report of the special master, Mr. Schuyler states, Evidence before the court is overwhelming that Newman has built and tested a prototype of his invention in which the output energy exceeds the external input energy. Therefore, there is no contradictory factual evidence. For the layman, that means the machine works. 
The expert then goes on to say, the patent office finding that such a machine is impossible is clearly erroneous. Mr. Schuyler also found that the patent office intentionally did not consider the formalities of Mr. Newman's application for a patent. Why wouldn't you go along again with a master that's former head of the, the uh, patent office who has credentials that the uh, judge called outstanding? Why wouldn't you go along with the man that you recommended in granting a patent? You ask mean questions, don't you? I think you'd have to address that question to our present commissioner. Are you acting on his orders? You might say that, yes. There you go. Operability or utility is uh, a rejection that virtually none of the patent examiners, and there's almost 5,000 of us, uh, were allowed to use in any of our uh, applications. The supervisor particularly always said that, um, oh, that's something only if you're dealing with uh, energy inventions. So what we find is that throughout the patent office, that rejection for something that we personally would feel would not be operable um, was not a judgment we were allowed to make except if we're in that security department that deals with energy and propulsion types of inventions. Here we have a brilliant device, again, almost 40 years ago. Look at the input and output. Test it over and over again, 0.3 milliwatts. Output, 223,000 watts. That's 22.4 kilowatts. That's plenty to run your car, your, your Tesla motor. Now, continuously output, if, if needed, on demand. So this little thing that looks like a cigarette pack, when he died, under mysterious, they said a heart attack, it's all kinds of evidence he was killed. This is real, usable power. It's stable. It is not transient. It is not noise. And it is not any other kind of spurious effect. This is a real effect. It's all coming from that little tiny box sitting behind the 500 watts of power. Behind the lamps, that little box is putting out all of that power, well over 500 watts, and yet it is receiving less than one third of a milliwatt of input power. This is April the 30th, 1987, at about 10.30 p.m., in the home of Mr. Sparky Sweet, the inventor of the very first vacuum triode. This is a most historical occasion. I was altered when I saw it because uh, my view was that you could be anywhere then in the universe. You could be in a cave, you could be anywhere, and you had energy. This was overwhelming to think that I could have energy and the whole world could have energy. That all of a sudden, we were on an equality economically. We didn't have to worry about the energy sources. The rest of that power is coming out of the surging energy of the vacuum. And this little box that you see right here, solid state, no moving parts, is the vacuum triode that's doing this very practical and historical work. He was shot at once with a silenced rifle from about 300 yards. The only thing that saved his life was he was an old guy and very feeble. He was stumbling as he coming up the steps and he fell down. He just flat fell down on the steps, caught his foot and fell right forward. And as his head went forward, the bullet went right by where his head was. And of course, the assassin was never found. This guy called me up. He said, we really need your help. And I said, the only way you're going to do this is that you disclose it, all of it, open source it, get it out there. I will see that we get it out to the entire scientific community. He says, no, no, no. I, it's Gollum, my precious, my precious, my precious. And I said, dude, you're, you're going to take this to your grave. He took it to his grave. Yep, it's gone. This very distraught lady who's Sparky's wife, She's saying Sparky's dead, and uh, that she said two strange men, she called them strange men, showed up at about five o'clock the night before, 
and they stayed for a little while and then they left and Sparky uh, an hour or two later having a cup of coffee and just killed over onto the floor called the ambulance and she was 75 years old they would not let her in the ambulance and the ambulance then called her back about 20 minutes later and said we don't think he's going to make it and uh, that was the end of that until the next morning when she called my sister-in-law and talked to her and said there are men here that said they're FBI and they got black vans and they're taking all this equipment what should I do? Good afternoon and welcome to this edition of Eyewitness Newsmakers. I'm your host, Doug Miller. On March the 23rd, chemists Stanley Pons and Martin Fleischmann rocked the world of science. They announced that they had achieved cold fusion in their laboratory at the University of Utah. The promise of a cheap and a plentiful energy supply grabbed the world's attention. It didn't put out a lot of power, but what was scary is that this is 1989, it made the, you know, cover of all the magazines. The way they took that avenue of discovery out of the scientific world is that there were people who were paid, who were corrupted, through scientific fraud at MIT. Next slide. Dr. Eugene Malov, dear friend of mine, PhD, Harvard and MIT, brilliant man. There was a man named Eugene Malov who it's quite possible was eliminated by the powers that be in the fossil fuel industry. He died in 2004, he was murdered that year, but Malov was a, an extremely important figure in the alternative energy world, especially in terms of what's called cold fusion. And he was at MIT in the, in the science office for education when he saw how they had changed the data on the reproducing the Pons Fleischmann experiment and he blew the whistle. Uh, I inadvertently was looking through some piles of paper that had been given to me in a casual manner by all these hot fusion physicists as they were trying to do their calorimetric uh, repeat of the Pons Fleischmann experiment. And to my utter astonishment, I can remember sitting at my desk in my study and actually seeing these two sheets of paper, the, one dated July 10th, 1989, and another dated July 13th, three days apart. The difference between July 10th and 13th was dramatic, and I was stunned. I couldn't believe what I was seeing. It looked like monkey business to me at the time, and it has turned out to be exactly that. It was a lower echelon person in the Plasma Fusion Center at MIT, one of the 16 authors of a scientific paper done under Department of Energy contract that had altered data. And that data is scientific fraud, as far as I'm concerned, and many other people are concerned. And it was, you know, it was hell on wheels. Finally get someone who brings him a, a zero-point device, solid state, no moving parts. And I said, Gene, we need to get this out to the public very quickly. Oh, no, they want to keep it secret. I begged him, and I begged him, and I begged him, and I begged him. He was beaten to death when he was over at his parents' home and was killed, murdered. Made to look like some thugs. They were, yeah, they were thugs, but they were, it wasn't a random murder. And the device vanished with him. Good friend of mine, dear friend. What we really had was a threat to the scientific establishment. The threat of it even being implied as real and having monies, shall we say, being diverted from their favored programs, and uh, that was a threat, no question. It was an actual threat of that happening. U.S. scientists making a huge breakthrough. A source tells CNN that for the first time ever, researchers have been able to create energy from a fusion reaction. Now, Laura, I could explain all of this in great detail, <laughs> of course. But basically, it's a giant step towards a clean energy future without dependence on fossil fuels. This is the first time, by all accounts, they've gotten more heat out than they put in. Not so fast. This supposed breakthrough, announced just as we were finishing this film, is a total distraction. The net gain 
0.1 kilowatt is enough to boil a kettle of water and not much else. But what is truly baffling is that they are not counting the actual input required to power the lasers to get the machine going. When you count the energy it took to generate the fusion reaction, it's actually a 1,200 times net loss. Furthermore, fusion reactions can generate heat in excess of 3 million degrees, which would ignite the oxygen in the surrounding air if a breach ever occurred. Everything about this is, at best, wrong. At worst, fraudulent. So why is this fake solution being pushed by every media outlet on the planet when we have had real solutions hidden in classified programs for a hundred years? Different people have different devices. Of the ones that have promise, there's certain themes that keep re-emerging. The first theme is torsion physics. Torsion physics is a fancy way of saying something that spins like this and something that spins like this. Think of it as like an hourglass shape. I think that it has to do with it representing the way energy moves in the universe. At the biggest levels, like the galaxy, it's a spiral. A tornado on Earth is this vortex motion. Our DNA is a stranded spiral. A second theme is plasma. A lightning bolt is plasma, right? The spark gap in a car is plasma. So plasma is the fourth state of matter. Solid water is ice. Add more energy, it melts and becomes water. Add more energy, it becomes steam. And then if you were to add even more energy, say through running an electric current through that steam or through any gas, you end up with plasma. You can think of it as maybe this liminal state or in-between state between the physical world and the non-physical world, whatever that is. There's some evidence emerging that plasma can provide a shielding of inertia. So if you imagine that you're a UFO and you need to zip around at crazy speeds, you can't pump the brakes too fast, otherwise everyone's going to slam into the windshield, right? But if you had some sort of inertial shield around the craft, i.e. like a plasma shield, you might be able to eliminate the inertia surrounding that and keep the occupants safe. Uh, I think this is why the UFOs seem to glow, plasma glows. A third theme is that of the ether. The conventional or mainstream understanding of the base level of reality is maybe the quantum C, tiniest particles all bumping into each other. The ether conceives of this differently. It says that there's a kind of a fluid geometry that is the base layer of physical reality, and that to understand that fluid geometry is to be able to really understand electricity, magnetism, and gravity. And this, according to Tesla and others, is the key to really understanding what he was getting at with all of his wireless transmission of energy stuff. But I believe that we're going to see something like a return of the ether. It won't be called that, but it'll be something like that that's going to enable us to make much more progress in these areas in the coming century. This gentleman, he had a car that would run on water, but it had to be modified. A local inventor has discovered a way, hear this, to use water to run your car. It's a major breakthrough that will no doubt make motorists happy. And as Ralph Robinson explains, the Pentagon is also showing lots of interest in this project. And he always kept that secret. He had a patent that he falsified the voltage and the frequency cycles per second because he didn't want anyone to reproduce it and leapfrog him financially. Again, this crazy inventor syndrome. And what happened, and when he passed away, there was a whole warehouse full of floppy disks and papers and everything, and his heirs wanted to sell it off. What people didn't realize is that this car was the least important thing Stan Meyer had. He had a toroid, and the toroid was a donut-shaped electromagnetic device that had had a national security order slapped on it. I was going to get it and openly disclose it. But though the scientific establishment may have ignored the likes of Meyer, the powerful military-industrial complex certainly hasn't. Over the past 10 years, 
Meyer says he's been quietly approached by many influential organizations who would never admit publicly to their involvement with him. This was a disaster. If we had a few hundred thousand we were going to offer, but we made it clear we were going to open source it. Well, they had a group, an engineering group from Michigan come in who had a lot more money because they had a big backer. And they were going to monetize it, keep it secret, try to repatent it, all the usual crazy ideas, which would be great if you're just developing a new software program, but not something that's going to change the world forever. Can't do it. They were working on a couple years. I get this hysterical call. He says, Dr. Greer, we need your help. We need your help. He says, they're on the run for their lives. They've been sabotaged. They've had death threats. And my advice was, forget about Gollum and be in my ring and my precious ring. In this case, it was literally a precious ring. Just put it out there. I will help spread it. We will build these up independently, have labs tested, and you cannot put that toothpaste back in the tube. You squeeze it hard enough. He says, yes, that's, uh, you're right. It's probably the only way. But they think they can find a safe country to go to. I said, you're going to have to go to another star system, my friend. I literally said that. No way that's going to happen. So sure enough, I find out a few months later, I'm meeting with a high-tech guy in Orange County. That entire team was assassinated. Was one, the one survived. Uh, it was just crying like a baby in this man's office. Technology shows that we can release energy up to beyond 2.5 million barrels of oil per gallon of water and do it safely. So it gives us the ability to not only uh, sustain and maintain the economies of the world, but also give us the abilities to uh, handle the environmental pollution problems at the same time. This sort of encapsulates, you know, five or ten of the suppression techniques, all the way from murder to crazy inventor syndrome, falsifying your patent, trying to make money first instead of proving the science first, etc. And, of course, he took this to his grave. He was poisoned and killed at a cracker barrel. An ignominious death, if ever I heard one. And Stan Meyer's water engine points us to a deeper mystery concerning energy in our universe, microscopic ball lightning. The late physicist Ken Shoulders developed a technology called charge clusters, which are likened to ball lightning. When they are discharged, they actually tap into the zero-point energy field. This is where most of the power in Stan Meyer's device was coming from. Like Stan, Ken Shoulders faced terrible suppression. And so I, I met with this CEO, and he says, yes, they approved a $5 million grant from DOE so we could develop this further because one of the effects it had that they were really pursuing was putting low-level, initially, radioactive waste in these charged clusters, and it would cause isotopes that were non-radioactive to be created. What does this mean? You clean up all the radioactive waste. However, the phenomenon, the reason it was doing it, was that it was actually activating, as it were, this baseline energy field that's at the fabric of space and time. And that's what they didn't want out. So in the rarest of events, that grant was published, and these vicious people who want to keep all this stuff secret went into the, the, the Secretary of, of Energy's office and said, pull that grant. And they pulled it. Another technology to harness the power of ball lightning is being developed by a team of engineers in Florida. They have successfully tested several prototypes that allow any internal combustion engine to run mostly on water. It's a little quicker, huh? This is a phenomenal system, patented, but it runs internal combustion engines on water with a little bit of gasoline in it so you don't have to modify the engine, it won't rust. What this means is, with Stan Meyer, you really had to have a different kind of engine and spark plug and all that. This conventional spark plug engine, all of it, because it has enough of the lubricant oil in it that it won't just freeze up the engine. And this is really what he's doing. Stan Meyer, this device, and many of the others, Ken Shoulders Charge Clusters, they're creating these small, microscopic ball lightnings 
that when they discharge are tapping into that zero point energy field and creating the motive force. Boom! That's why the concussion from the thunderclap is so huge. It's a huge amount of energy, and it's actually sourced from the, from the vacuum energy. All the dots connected. This is what's happening, right? So how we need to make the thunderclap engine. Many times breakthroughs are made because the inventor or the scientist was inspired by looking at nature. The same systems and the same mechanisms that exist in nature that you can see can also exist in the devices that you build. So by trying to mimic that, you can tap into the intelligence that nature has already shown you when it comes to being efficient with the energy transmission mechanisms. Another current technology was recently investigated by Dr. Greer and his engineering team at an undisclosed location in the Arizona desert. One, two, three, four, five, six magnesium alloy specially configured plates. This thing's the size of a nice sized shoebox. The circuitry you see on the right is a misdirect because the guy has crazy inventor syndrome and thinks he can keep it secret and make a trillion dollars. You don't interfere with the big, powerful people. You don't put them out of business. They're still in business. They still have those 50-year leases on the lines and, the, and all the power transformers. You'd be able to get one of my power plants, just replace a coal-fired plant. You know, but it wouldn't be big news or anything because I'm just selling the electricity to them, okay? And then they're gonna say, wow, we're making more money at this plant than we are on the others. So they're gonna put them all out, you see? They're not gonna let me in. They're gonna fight me tooth and nail. But I'm, but I'm gonna be very sneaky about it. This thing, for three years, have been sitting in this near a chicken coop in his backyard out in the desert, putting out three kilowatts of power continuously, and we cranked it up to five kilowatts. No input power. And it's running off the magnetic flux of the space around it that he can tune to any place on the Earth so it's correct, and boom. This thing, solid state, no moving parts. We just saw this. But he's a textbook case of making every wrong decision tried to patent it. Well, you'll see in a moment what happened. He ended up getting put in prison for a week. He has had sabotage, death threats, murder of people around him. Yeah, I spent eight days in that jail. When I went before the court, the judge said, come here, don't you? And he says, read this. You sign it, you go home. You don't sign it, you go to jail. And all it was is I would not ever in my lifetime, ever, through me or anyone else, if anybody else was manufacturing these, I'll go to jail. And here's the secrecy order he was slapped with. <laughs> but look at the date. 1984. <laughs> it's almost 40 years ago. So you're doing the same thing, patent office. People think this is a myth. No, here's a secrecy order. See, so I don't want to go through that again. I'm scared my family and everybody. Uh, so now what we're going to do, I'm going to be very quiet. I'm going to build my one megawatt. It'll take two and a half years to build it. Because it's very complicated. i gotta, I got to acclimate it to the Earth. Technologies like this and countless others will never see the light of day without a radically new strategy. Dr. Greer is preparing to launch a multi-centered, state-of-the-art research and development lab that will develop zero-point energy technology, live streaming 24-7 for security and transparency. All research results, data, and plans would be released to the world open source freely available to the public and the scientific community. This will require broad public support to make this a reality. With this strategy, zero point energy is achievable, but it is only half of what has been suppressed. And now we get into the really cool stuff. Look at the dates, 1919, Pakowski Frost experiment, where they actually had high-frequency systems where things levitated, defying 
gravity. And then T. Townsend Brown, and he had very high voltage systems, electrogravitic, they call it, where high voltage would cause this lift effect and would actually create, if you will, uh, a bubble, an electromagnetic field that would allow an object to move at enormous speeds and free of the forces of gravity, what's called gravity control. An Office of Naval Research report on T. Townsend Brown's electrogravity device includes a transcript of a conversation between Major General V.E. Bertrandius and Lieutenant General H.A. Craig. Bertrandius remarks, it sounds terribly screwy, but Friday I went down to a place called the Townsend Brown Foundation, and believe it or not, I saw a model of a flying saucer. Townsend Brown was an independent experimenter, and he uh, actually worked on, as, as you can see, very large uh, replications of saucers that he believed were vital for a different type of propulsion. The big question is, can I prove this? This I consider to be a very serious Rosetta Stone. This is Young Men magazine. The article is titled, The G-Engines Are Coming. By far the most potent source of energy is gravity. Using it as power, future aircraft will attain the speed of light. Now, in this article, they give you the names, they give you the time frame, they give you the dates, they give you the defense contractors, universities, and research centers that are actively pursuing cracking the gravity barrier. They talk about the Lear Corporation, the Sperry Rand Corporation, the Bell Aircraft Corporation, all trying desperately to crack the gravity barrier. And it's clear from the eyewitness testimony, they've done it. And then we have Michael Schratt to thank for this, great archivist and historian. And he's found these are journals that date from the 50s, one, you know, 1956, where the big buzz in the aerospace industry was anti-gravity, quote unquote, the G engines, gravity engines. And this was actually in the open literature until they figured out how it really works and it all went black. Now, where did they get the technology? This was an interesting crash retrieval. This is prior to Roswell. This is November 1946. This was seen by a courier who went to Wright-Patterson Air Force Base, and he had a guard, an MP, who he was friends with. And this guard said, you know what? I got something I want to show you. So he brought him into this facility at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base, and there was this craft sitting there. And this little red dot that I have here shows you the attempted point of entry. They were using a diamond tip drill bit to try to get into this craft. So the question is, if this is one of ours, why would they be trying to get into this? So is this the beginning origin point of a reverse engineering program? You know, some of the UFO crash retrieval material, we've looked at it and we found that the materials used are very strange. When extraterrestrial material is recovered through military crash retrievals and its metallic structure is examined under a microscope, the metal is so pure that we could not replicate it, even in a vacuum in space. This is because extraterrestrial crafts are not manufactured on a Ford assembly line the way humans would manufacture something. Everything in the material universe has a frequency and a corresponding sound vibration that creates and sustains its being. Extraterrestrials manufacture objects by first creating a resonant frequency. For instance, the frequency of a flying saucer. This is a sort of vibrational blueprint that interacts with the substrate of the physical universe, pulling into existence from other dimensions atoms and molecules that then organize and condense into the structure of the object being created. In this way, extraterrestrial material is literally manifested into being, like trans-dimensional 3D printing or Star Trek's replicator technology. Moving on to 1963, this is a Marine. He was called from Cherry Point, North Carolina to an undisclosed location, and his job was to guard something there. And when he got to this facility, they opened up these doors, and he saw 
propped up on scaffolding, this 40-foot diameter dish-shaped craft that looked like a fat hamburger. It was about 15 feet tall. He noticed that there was a white circle painted on the floor, and his job was to shoot to kill anyone who would try to breach that circle. They were trying three ways to get into this craft. Number one was a diamond tip drill bit. So we've got two cases of this now. Number two was an acetylene torch. That failed. And then the final attempt was bringing in two 18-wheeler tractor trailer low boy trucks that had these very high voltage generating devices. And they were using a laser to get into this craft. In a previously unreleased interview with aerospace designer Brad Sorensen, Sorensen describes a secret air show that took place at Norton Air Force Base on November 12th of 1988. A classified military exhibit in which so-called alien reproduction vehicles were unveiled. The craft were hovering off the floor with no landing gear underneath and nothing supporting it from above. When asked, where did they get these concepts from? Sorensen states, they said they copied it. By the way, these went all through the solar system. The components, Mercury era, 1959 to 1960s, early 60s. So these were operational. When did we master gravity control where these were being functionally built by classified projects here on Earth, not extraterrestrial? October 1954. So here we are, riding on the surface of the roads and cars belching out garbage and pollution. When I say a lost century, it really is. They were already working on these programs as early as 1948. And during the Clinton administration, they were spending $100 million a day on black budget programs. The big question is, has this been integrated into the aerospace industry? And if we look at what the witnesses are reporting, they're reporting similar things across time, across dates, locations. Now this is March 23rd, 1966. This is Temple, Oklahoma. Primary eyewitness name is Eddie Laxon. He was an electrical engineer. He was working at Shepard Air Force Base. So he's commuting to work. It's about 5.06 in the morning. And I want to stress that this is not my case. This is an actual United States Air Force Project Blue Book case, and it can be verified through Project Blue Book. So he's going to work in the morning, and all of a sudden, something is blocking the road in front of him. And he notices something that looks all the world like a tipped over bowling pin. It's about 75 feet across. On the starboard side of the craft that you see here, there was an air stair cutout door and a man. I want to stress this was a man. This was not an alien. He was wearing two-piece green military fatigues. He had a baseball cap with the bill turned up, and he was shining a flashlight near the bottom of the steps. Above this air stair door, there was an interesting stinger or spire that tapered back and swept back to the end of the vehicle. And at the end of this spire, there was about an eight inch diameter sphere. And that's interesting because I keep getting reports from the eyewitnesses of spheres and balls and protrusions and prongs sticking out of these UFOs. And if you look at what the eyewitnesses are describing to us, and you look and examine high voltage electrical equipment, it's a match. I believe I can make a case that the components that people are seeing on these UFOs are off the shelf high voltage electrical components. When this gentleman, who was this military green fatigue gentleman, when he noticed that he was being watched by Eddie Laxon, he scurried up this ladder, he slammed this door shut, and then there was a high-pitched drilling noise this craft levitated off the ground and then took off like a spark on a grinding wheel and made no sonic boom whatsoever. This is back in 1966. Rockets are obsolete. Solid rockets are obsolete. Jets are obsolete.
So how can all this be true and we're still flying jets? This Elon Musk tweeted this out. That's all very comical. It's not comical when astronauts I know have friends that died in this, the Challenger tragedy. Flight controllers here looking very carefully at the situation. Obviously a major malfunction. We're awaiting word. They're holding their breath just, I'm sure, as everyone else is. In the center of the fire and the smoke, you can't see any form of what was once the shuttle. Here they are, going up on a Roman candle 40 years, 50 years, 60 years after we already had gravity control. This is the biggest cover up and scandal in the hist known history of the world, full stop. We've already got the technology to do away with solid rocket boosters. We've already got the technology to take away completely liquid rockets. Why wasn't the Challenger crew briefed on this technology if we already had the breakthrough in 1954? And so then people get into, well, how can this be? I put this out a lot because it's a, a you know, not declassified document. But you have an organization called MAGIC, M-A-J-I, Majority Intelligence Committee, and a few others that run these covert projects. They are beyond black. What do I mean? They're unacknowledged special access projects. I'm sure you also unacknowledged. But these are the projects that are off the radar, even of the people who manage the black projects. So I call this beyond black. These are way off book. And this was a security alert with the distribution list back in the 90s. So I gave this some people in the Pentagon, like Admiral Wilson, who I briefed, who was the head of intelligence, Joint Chiefs of Staff, and they got inside the program. I'm doing that now for a whole new generation of people since the law was passed to get to the bottom of what UFOs are, or what they call now UAPs. Nobody calls them that. It's so ridiculous. Let me tell you what a UFO, UFA, they make up these fake names that are obfuscating, unexplained aerial phenomena, like ball lightning or something. No, it isn't. First of all, it's not unexplained. Secondly, it's not aerial, and it's not just some phenomenon. They're either man-made UFOs or extraterrestrial. That's it, keep it simple. The hardest thing for the senators and the White House people and the general public, and particularly the media, to understand, or scientists, is that if this is true, how could it be that it has been kept secret from the people? They're very good at counterintelligence. So it's structured, as Eisenhower warned us, beware the military industrial complex. In the councils of government, we must guard against the acquisition of unwarranted influence, whether sought or unsought, by the military industrial complex. A very strong warning of what he saw coming because he'd been living with it for eight years. The CIA was only created in 1947, and the Pentagon and its generals were, you know, gaining much more power and as the nuclear age progressed. And Eisenhower saw it. The combination of military power with industry. If you think about what the industrial part is of the military-industrial complex, the industrial is basically the fossil fuel giants and, you know, and the chemical companies and the now increasingly the pharmaceutical companies that are running rampant and increasing their wealth by astronomical proportions. This is just the value of the raw materials. Look at these numbers, $150 trillion in oil. That's actually an underestimate now. $40 trillion in uh, coal, a trillion in uranium. But that's just the raw. When you the multiplier effect, when you take it from there to retail and creating the energy, it's, it's many more hundreds of trillions. And that's what's being protected along with the Bretton Woods petrodollar, where they decide to make the dollar the reserve currency of the world, but it's based cost the petrodollar. 
So the entire macroeconomic, global economic system is sitting on a crumbling foundation of the energy system we use, and it's going to have to be transitioned. It should have happened 100 years ago. Now we're out of time. The malefactors of great wealth, as Teddy Roosevelt once warned us about, writing the laws, you know, paying politicians to write the laws that, that they want. Why is that happening? Robert Kennedy Jr. wrote the introduction to both editions of my recent book, which was Horseman of the Apocalypse Became Climate in Crisis in its most recent version. And he, he said this, which I think is quite apropos to what we've been, what I've been talking about today. They work together in lockstep coordinated by Capitol Hill trade associations, lobbying firms, captive agencies, and paid off politicians to increase authoritarian control, to transform all of us into mindless consumers, to shift middle class wealth to billionaire plutocrats, and to liquidate our Purple Mountain majesties and our entire planet. They have declared war on democracy and personal freedom. Shadowy government with its own Air Force, its own Navy, its own fundraising mechanism, and the ability to pursue its own ideas of the national interest, free from all checks and balances, and free from the law itself. So get your mind around this. There is the government, constitutional government of the United States, and then there's this other secret government operation, which has more money more power, more technology. It is a criminal enterprise. It is not sanctioned by the president, and it is not sanctioned by Congress. And yet they're using our tax dollars and are raping the planet and destroying the earth and impoverishing half the planet. That's what we have to fix. We've got at least 109 UFO crash retrieval cases. All we need is one to be correct. And if they exploited the technology associated with these craft and procured that and put it into our aerospace industry, they have made a tremendous breakthrough in aerospace technology that I think that our Challenger astronauts should have been briefed on, our Apollo astronaut should have been briefed on, and we could have avoided all of this obsolete technology, and we could all move forward to that wonderful world and are not basically bound to these oil industries. Some people wonder why we don't know more about this. Why isn't the media telling us what's really going on? We have about 15 billionaires and six corporations controlling 90% of the media in the United States. We've got AT&T, Comcast, Walt Disney Company, National Amusements, that includes Viacom and CBS News, and Fox Corporation. They rely on advertising revenue, and that's going to mean they're towing a certain line. This is a CIA document. It was released. I was surprised it was released, and it says that we have a relationship with every major wire service newspaper, News Weekly, and television network in the nation. In many instances, we have persuaded reporters to postpone, change, hold, or scrap stories that could have adversely affected national security interests or jeopardized sources and methods. Here's another part of your Truman Show you, everyone's been forced to live in. The idea that we have a free press or that we have a free market economy. Pray tell any economist in here, I challenge you, how do we have a free market if the most important scientific breakthroughs of the last 100 years have been ruthlessly confiscated, people murdered, and kept off the market? No, it's a controlled economy. It's a controlled media. It's an abomination and it's killing the planet. There were days when I wished I had never seen free energy. The amount of pain that uh, you wake up at 3 o'clock in the morning because you can't do anything and you know that pollution can be cleaned up. And everyone is on the same economic basis. And uh, because you're powering everything with the free energy, you can do really what the philosopher Joseph Campbell said, he said to seek after your bliss. And I think that free energy does it.
And so what do we do? Well, the current paradigm we just went through, the new would be unlimited abundance, no poverty in 20 years. There would be no poverty on earth in 20 years with these technologies. Universal peace, because you're not fighting over everything now. And earth in harmony with humanity and the biosphere restored. It's important to realize that the technology that is required to heal earth already exists and has existed for a long time that the problem is not fundamentally technological. If we came into coherence around the goal of healing Earth, we could do it in five years because the capacity of life to heal is just incredible. But we're just in the way of it all the time. I mean, even look what happens if you stop paving over a parking lot. In five years, cracks appear. Weeds are growing out of it. In 15 years, you see chunks of pavement here and there, and trees are growing. In 50 years, you don't even know a parking lot was ever there. In order to maintain Earth in a state of ugliness and unlife requires constant effort because the power of life to live is so strong. That's what life wants to do, it wants to live. We only make 100 million cars a year. If we converted like that, which is not gonna happen, all manufacturing of automobiles to these zero point energy generators, it would take, do the math, 15 years. We barely have 15 years left. The date I've been given, 2035 to 2040, and we're done. The scale of the transition is almost unthinkable. There are an estimated 14 million kilometers of paved roads across the Earth. There are many millions more of power lines comprising the so-called smart grid. A real smart grid would be no grid at all. We need a compassionate transition. Instead of displacing millions of workers who support today's energy infrastructure, we must enlist them in the radical transformation of our world that lies before us. You've all heard of the Hopi prophecy, probably. There are two lines on the Hopi prophecy. Right now, our entire planet is on the line, the upper line that terminates. We're an extinction level event trajectory. That's the path we're on. There's another line in the Hopi prophecies, and that's one that we have to jump onto that goes on and on forever. That's our choice. We, the people, have to choose it. It is not gonna be done for you like a Ouija board in Washington or at Wall Street. We're gonna have to unite and do this ourselves. You can imagine a civilization that has figured out the over-unity question as being one in which the centralization of power and therefore the centralization of the inputs necessary for the growth of civilization becomes more decentralized. So rather than these power stations that are clustered around big cities, you can have energy generation mechanisms in every home. And this is why it's a new world, because it's the power to the people. And what it means, it's literally not just electric power, and energy, but actual political power. And in the industrial era, from the 1800s to now, it's gotten more and more concentrated. This is gonna return the power to every village and every person. Even the deserts shall bloom, as it says in the Bible. And in Africa and around the world, they're gonna leapfrog past where we are with all this electricity and wiring and power lines and power plants like they did telephones. They went straight to cell. But this is a bigger leap where all over the world, all these impoverished areas, every little village and community will have its own energy generator for pulling water out of the humidity of the air. We have the technology to do that now. Why is it used? Because it uses a lot of electricity, which is polluting and expensive. It'll be a global village all interconnected, but also all self-sufficient. Complete local self-sufficiency with no pollution. That's the world we could have had beginning in the 20s. A 100 years later, may I suggest we accept it. It's time. We are a 100 years behind where we should be right now. Why are we still pounding metal nails into boards to build houses? Why are we still loading up shipping containers on tankers and taking two months to get here? This is all a construct. And why I call this a time snap? <clears throat> a time snap is when 
things have gone so far off track, the only way to fix it is for the people to unite and come up with a totally different strategy where in a decade to two decades, we make up for a hundred years. It can happen. And you know, if nothing else, humans do want to survive. But this is now a survival question for every man, woman, and child on the earth. So that's why we have to do this. We have to remember also that the capacity for life to heal is almost unlimited. And we see this already with people who are restoring ecosystems and regenerating farmland. You know, even in a few years, miracles happen. You know, springs that have been dead for generations come back to life. Species that hadn't been seen in the area seemingly magically reappear. And so we can't forget that. We can't succumb to a despair that is founded in our distrust of the power of life itself, which again, is part of the origin of our current condition. Visualize your house off the grid, clean energy, no wiring. Why? Because every device, whether it's this size device or your refrigerator, will have a small solid state quantum vacuum zero point energy device in it, running it. So there's no electromagnetic fields running through your house because you don't need wiring. Think what that'll do to construction costs and the simplicity of it. And here we are in the Sahara Desert and you wanna grow food? You create a, a biosphere dome. It's run on free, clean energy as you, we, we've demonstrated. You're growing oranges, you can grow crops. You can have different zones in it for different temperature and humidity control. So anywhere on the planet that you need to have foods, it could be done under controlled circumstances, digitally automated, but with no cost for the energy and the water, virtually none. What that means is the food scarcity and starvation we're facing, that goes away very quickly when, in, in a 20 year period. Here's your, your typical street in your neighborhood, anywhere in the world. And as we bring these technologies out, the grid comes down, we don't need it anymore. When there's a snowstorm or hurricane or whatever, you don't lose power because you're not dependent on a grid that's gonna be torn down by ice and snow and wind. You don't need wires. And all these wires, the clutter of wires, you don't need them because every device will have its own source of energy. This could have been done decades ago. As we bring these out, all these freeways will be replaced all the lines and power lines will go away. We can float above the surface. And in every city in the world, we're gonna see this transformation, every village in the world. And then we have these cities, you know, eventually where you're just floating, there are, there are guided pathways, you know, the ground is pristine, and then we're going out into space. So everyone remember, where our destiny is. Our destiny is not just Earth, it's the whole cosmos. How is that gonna be possible? The only way we're allowed to go outside our solar system is if we become a peaceful civilization. Otherwise, it's locked down. You know, we are considered a planet that is da dangerous and armed. Each one of us is very invested in the world as it is. We've built careers, relationships and goals based on a world that doesn't include ETs and anti-gravity and free energy and healing devices and all this cool abundant stuff. And so we need to understand and, and really know if we are ready for that investment to be disrupted. So one of the most powerful things that any of us can do is to look in our own hearts, imagine the world that could be, and ask ourselves, are we ready for that? If the answer is yes, then hold that readiness in your heart in all the excitement that it's due. If the answer is no, if there are some lingering doubts or fears or concerns, then go into that. Follow that. That's an important thread that you can follow back to something inside of you that needs attention. It's that obstacle that may be keeping us from living in this new world. At Rendlesham Forest in the Air Force Base in 1980, a 
roughly pyramid-shaped craft landed. You've all heard this account probably, but I'll recount it for you, and the part that's classified you don't know. There were these kind of luminous beings that literally teleported, floated outside this black pyramid and communicated with these Air Force officers. And the ET said, we are your descendants who have become interstellar but we are from 500,000 years in the future. And we are now here, they basically materialized time travel to 1980 because this was a covert nuclear weapons facility that if that had been disclosed could have triggered World War III. And saying, you've got to stop doing this. If you stay on this path, we, your children's 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 children, 20,000 years into the future, we won't exist. That was... 42 years ago. So they have been warning these civilizations from other star systems. Some of them are our descendants, not all, not all, but some are. The key thing to remember here is, is that the fact that that happened is a message of great hope. It means that there is a chance, a good chance, if we reach into our higher consciousness and we go forward with a strategy that isn't based on materialism and greed, this is a massive undertaking, my friends, but I'm convinced we can do it, but we have to completely rethink how we live, how we act, and the whole business model of what we're doing. And if we do that, here's the world we're gonna have. We will be remembered as the generation that pulled ourselves off the extinction line of the Hopi prophecy and moved on to the one that goes on forever. Thank you all. We, we can do it. Nelson Mandela once said, our human compassion binds us the one to the other, not in pity or patronizingly, but as human beings who have learned how to turn our common suffering into hope for the future. We have every reason to have hope the solutions already exist. If we come together as one human family, we can reclaim our lost century. I want to be free, so free, like a feather blowing through the breeze, like a bird in a tree, like a dolphin in the sea. I want to fly high, so high, Mama, I'm coming home to the place where I belong. Pacha Mama. Watch your mama.